the last product to leave the J. Wood Browning store. I moved to Columbus, first job out of college back in 1980 and um, met my wife and married her shortly thereafter. And the building's been in her family. Her great grandfather was J. Wood Browning, uh, J. Wood Browning, and that's who, this, who owned and operated the store. And so the Browning's been in the Browning family forever. And uh, a relative owned it who moved out of the country and uh, uh, didn't have a need for it. So I bought it just to try to keep it in the family and of hopes maybe one day of trying to do something uh, to, to preserve it or at least, at least keep the history in the family. So we've had it now. It's, uh, I've owned it since uh, probably the mid, uh, mid to late 80s. So I know the store started around the turn of the century in 1900 or so, um, maybe a little before that. Mr. Browning operated as a general store. He also was a, a distributor for the Juniper Casket Company that was uh, where they made caskets not far from here and they sold those. Um, and uh, um, Mr. Browning... Uh, lived across the railroad tracks and uh, my mother-in-law uh, can remember as a child seeing her mom standing out by the tracks and uh, putting the mail bag up on a hook so the train could come by and pick up the mail and drop the mail bag off for box springs as they as they rode by um, but uh, the uh, it, was, it was a general merchandise store i think they sold a little bit of everything in, including caskets and and burial gowns and foodstuffs and farm, small farm implements and tools. Um, and um, as I said earlier, we've got some of the old uh, ledger books that show where people would come in and buy things. And then over time, they'd bring, uh, you know, everything from eggs to bacon and uh, different things back as payment towards uh, towards their bill. And he would keep a running total of, of how much they owed him. Well, this building was very special to, to my daddy when he was growing up. And uh, later on in life, he used to visit here a lot just to sit on the porch. Uh, he, he loved it that much because he grew up near here. Uh, his daddy, my grandfather, was the section foreman on the railroad right here next to the building. Granddaddy Aiken was section foreman on the railroad here from 1907 until about 1944. And he lived in Geneva, which is just up the railroad track from here. And I think the reason this building was so special is one of the uh, stories that I heard my daddy tell very, very often was about the Coca-Cola bottles and Royal Crown bottles and uh, knee-high, the old soda pop bottles that he and his brothers would pick up around town in Geneva and bring to the store to turn in for the penny deposit. And that's how they made their little extra money besides, you know, doing other things around town for the older folks. But uh, he would bring bottles to the local stores up there where he lived. But the merchants there would say, well, these are our bottles anyway. And they would confiscate the bottles and take them away from the kids. Well, they would walk the railroad track down here to Mr. Browning and he would gladly pay the penny deposit for each of those bottles. And that was uh, the reason he had good memories here is because Mr. Browning would give them a penny apiece for the bottles, and then they would turn around and spend their money here with Mr. Browning, buying candy. And he said by the time they got back to Geneva, they had eaten all their candy. <laughs> so it's a good ways from here. What do you say? It's about, I can't remember how many miles it is up the railroad track, but it's, it's, it's a good at, walk. Least, yeah. <laughs> at least five miles, yeah. maybe, maybe a little further. But uh, anyway, later in life, Daddy thought so much of this building that he wanted to duplicate it, and he did in his backyard at, at my at our home in Waverly Hall. He didn't quite duplicate the complete appearance of it, but he did a good job of, of recreating an old store. And this was kind of his, uh, kind of his idea of what a store should look mm -hmm. like back then. And he was very impressed by it growing up. And this is the first time that I've been here probably since uh, he and I visited here and I made his picture here on the porch about 1982 maybe. And so one thing that makes this store so unique is that the name is still painted on the front, yep. um, sitting in here like a time capsule. And you said, Mr. Warden, that no one's ever repainted that. that that's... No, that's that's been like that since the mid '80s, since I first came out here. And um, they've not, there's the family. No one's been out here to really care for the place since Gossett closed down, which is, I would think, that's at least 60, 80 years old on there. It's it's not. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Been, no upkeep to it at all. And when did you say it closed down? 
I have thought it was in the 40s, but I, I don't, I'd have to confirm that. I don't know. Uh, I noticed that, you know, on Find a Grave that Mr. Browning, uh, J. Wood Browning Sr., the original, mm -hmm. uh, died in 1942. I think that was about so, thereabouts is about when they mm -hmm. shut the store down. That, that um, sounds about right. And he's so. buried right up uh, here in the cemetery. One of these cemeteries. I've been to the grave before. He mm -hmm. and the last name they were, uh, he and then the, another, I think his wife's last name was a Purvis. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're buried up there. I like the cedar logs on the porch too. I yeah. think that's cool. So I built a little shop. Looks like a kind of like a cabin right above my house. And I've got, that's what I put on my porch. Post. I went out and cut some cedar trees and just looking just like this. Nice. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna this little tag. This is a piece of metal. Oh yeah, sure. Well. Can tell if it's a metal tag. Let's see what it says. It's got something on it. I'm get my light to work. Yeah, there you go. It's a company right there on the end. Let's see. That says Eagle Lock Company. Mm -hmm. hmm. That's a tag off of a showcase. Eagle Lock Company. It's like Aryville, Connecticut, U.S. Yeah, yeah, sure. That's a tag off of a, a showcase for Eagle Lock Company locks. Because, see, it, it, it carries the... Uh, different things that they featured see it says cabinet locks hold the light over this way just a little bit let's see yeah. it says cabinet locks trunk locks padlocks over here it says special hardware wood screws and night latches how about that <laughs> now i had to put my glasses on to see that i couldn't there's no way i could read it otherwise <laughs> that's cool the bar so do y'all, did you, did you have anything or know when, when the store was supposedly built and opened? I don't. I can uh, go back and look on the ledgers what the first date mm -hmm. we got, but, uh. I've never researched it, but I know that Granddad Aiken did business here because Daddy talked about that. Uh, and his name's probably in one of those ledger books. I if you, if it's ledger books in the World War One era, uh, on up until the. You know, 1930s and well, 20s and 30s. The uh, the bar is missing off of this, but this is very unique that you would pull the the bolt out. The bolt has a pin on the inside. Here's the pin for this one. this one. How about that? Handmade blacksmith latch. Mm -hmm. And they had three of them. So they could latch, did, yeah. the latch from the inside. No, I'm sorry. What was this? We latch this around here. Keep that it open. That was, that was, that was, that was that to keep it open. open. Okay. It will latch right there. See? Like that. Oh, cool. <laughs> sure. But you don't see too many old general stores with the bay windows like this. Certainly don't see too many left with the doors created like this either. We took two wide boards and covered them with the beaded ceiling. And a bunch of nails. Lots and lots of nails. Granddaddy Aiken's smokehouse in Geneva that was built long before he came along had doors like this on it. Really? And the smokehouse still still exists. Does it? It's uh it's behind a, a house there in Geneva. And it has doors like that on it. And how about the screen doors? Those are just wonderful. Yeah. I like that the doors cover the screen doors and that, that's the reason they're so well protected I believe. And they're still intact. 
wondered if they ever said colonial bread on there. I don't know. You, know, you used those? to. I used to remember seeing those. And sometimes they had those push plates on them. That's that right. were ten that had the advertisement on them. It'd uh -huh. say colonial bread or mm. RC cola. Or but how many people would have come and gone through these? Oh doors? my lord! Yeah. You just look at the way that threshold worn down. That's from yes, thousands and thousands sure of people enough. walking through there. Oh, there's the there's the lock for the front screen door. Yeah, it's right here. Oh yeah. About that. And that latched onto something. Huh. If this would have gone down in there, the floor is safe if you did, mm -hmm. causing that to come off the hinge there. And I think they had it where they could run a chain through this and through the door there. Mr. Warden, you said that this everything used to still be in the store. Yeah, when I first came out here in the mid '80s, there was it just like they'd walked away from it. There were still display counters and cases, and the shelves still had uh, some old merchandise in it. There were some uh, uh, textile, some some fabric. Uh, I don't remember any food stuff. I think somebody taken that out, but uh, there was still. Uh, um, I bought a old. Uh, uh, balance beam cotton scale. There was a, uh, a turning plow that you pull behind a mule. Uh, but yeah, they, it was it's like pretty much somebody just said, all right, we're through and just walked out the door. Wow. Uh, and all that stuff was gathered up and um, uh, somebody from out of town came in and, and offered the, the individual that owned it at that time, offered him money for everything in the contents and he carried all that down to, um, to Albany, Georgia and had a auction antique auction down there and people came from all over the southeast to buy to buy this and he publicized it and i attended the auction but some of the uh the fixtures the counter tops and display cases and stuff they sold for a large sum of money for people that were like building uh, vintage restaurants and bars and things like that it was mm -hmm. drew quite the quite the uh quite the crowd one shoehorn Dan, how would a general store like this have been laid out? Well, pretty much like he said, you would have had the space back here that would have been off limits to customers with counters down each side, usually in a U shape. And uh, all that area right in there would have been for the public. But you did not go behind the counter in a, in a store back in those days. No one outside of the owner and his employees went behind the counter. and. Everything was kept in showcases. And you, when you went in the store then, you would tell the merchant what you want, what, what you wanted. You would either bring a list and give them your list and they would reach up on the shelves and get all your things together for you. Okay. And of course, after telephone came along, you would call and tell them what you wanted and they'd get it all together and deliver it or you'd go to the store and pick it up. But you can see that there would be a pot belly heater right in the middle. See where the uh, stove glue goes out. Oh, yeah. So the pot billy heater would sit right here. And this is where everybody in the community probably gathered around, right here. It has a uh, fireplace, too. I see over there. That looks like that might have been a later addition. Yeah. Looks like it may have been a door there at one time or something. Yeah. Hmm. If this rack here would have been for things like shovels and yard rakes and hoes and things to, you know, when it hung in the ceiling. So they had a rod right here, and I can remember this is probably a roll of either butcher paper yeah. or brown paper that stood right there that pulled down and could tear off because there's the, the notch where the rod went through there. I see there's um used to be a window or something 
right yeah, there. there and I guess this would have been the office back here, Dan? Most likely they usually had an office back here in the back somewhere or a feed room, you know, feed and fertilizer and stuff like that that was kept in a back area. And the wood on the walls back here hasn't been painted and it's just absolutely beautiful. And this used to be something that was quite common. These were everywhere. But like everything else around here, most all of these old stores are gone. Mm -hmm. uh, there's very few left that are original. And uh, this one is a, is a great example of, of what those old stores looked like. This is what we call them Dollar Generals now. Yeah. <laughs> but that was, yeah. the, that was the old, old timey Dollar General. They were every few miles. That's right. Those ones because people couldn't drive them. It was a big deal. You had uh, spoken earlier about the mail getting delivered here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Off the train. And uh, back then, the train, all the trains had a caboose and they had a, uh, a mail car generally. And the, so the mail here, a lot of times they were sorted on the train. So when they got to the next stop, if they were going this way, the next stop, the next town they came to was Geneva, and you mailed a letter here, they would, they'd have it sorted and they'd put it in the sack that got brought off at Geneva. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, it was, uh, it, was, it was pretty efficient. One old product still on the shelf. What is that? Indian head gasket shellac compound. Is that shellac? Yes, sir. Something for sealing gaskets. Not caskets, yeah. gaskets <laughs> with a G. Take that with you and put it in your store. <laughs> Here you go, <laughs> That's cool. Here you go, Dan. The last product to leave the J. Wood Browning store. What's today's date? Uh, February the 10th of 2023. That's right. Wow. These are old dry cell batteries, or what's left of them. Uh, this is what used to operate the old telephones back in the old days that uh, back when you had the switchboard in the local area as a matter of fact box springs had its own telephone system they had a switchboard here and i saw the switchboard bobby smith in uh, manchester owned the old switchboard from box springs it was only about this big square and it was in a private home here and he he uh, got it from the lady who was the original operator but uh, the switchboard uh, was the local telephone si uh, system right here in Box Springs. And anyway, if you had a phone in your house, if you were fortunate enough to have a phone back in those days, this is what they operated on, was these old dry cell batteries. These have rotted, but a lot of times you'll see online people asking, what is this? I found this in my yard, what is this? That is the core out of those old batteries. And these came in different sizes, you know. The old flashlight batteries even had one. And occasionally you'll find one, you know, somewhere. Uh, that's the history lesson for today. And here's the old well for the store out back. And this is another thing that you don't see left around here too often is the old community well. Mm -hmm. It seems that every old store in the area had a well just outside nearby that 
everyone would gather around to. Is that was that for just anybody could come get water out of that? That's that's, you, that's right. When you got to the store with your your mules and wagons yeah, and, yeah. and stuff, you had to have some place to water the animals. So that's mainly what it was used for, and then to drink water out of, of course. But and they would have had something here to help fight fires in case fire broke out in the store. But not too many of the old community wells left like this one.